Good afternoon, everyone. I said good afternoon, everyone. There we go. And thank you all for joining me to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the signing of Magna Carta, a document described as, quote, the greatest constitutional document of all times, the foundation of the freedom of the individual against the arbitrary authority of the despot, close quote. Now, I use the term here, term greatest here, to mean most important, not the best, not the final form. And I say most important because I mean Magna Carta is the constitutional document that is the fountainhead of all subsequent pro-freedom constitutions. It is Magna Carta that established the idea and the practice of limited government in Western civilization, and it is Magna Carta and its intellectual and political descendants that ultimately made individual rights and political freedom a reality. At a time today when we see, feel, and are subjected to the ever-encroaching power and restrictions of a government, at a time when so many of our freedoms are being devoured by power-hungry politicians and would-be theocrats, it is important, I think, to remember that such governmental tyranny has not always been accepted by a people, that there come times in history when a people must say, enough to their government. And the most influential instance of that since the plebeian secessions in ancient Rome is the barons at Runnymede 800 years ago who said, enough to a king who, despite his horrendous reputation, was probably not anywhere near as tyrannical or totalitarian as many would-be dictators that we face today. Now, in the time we have this afternoon, I have omitted any lengthy discussion of the various weaknesses of the Great Charter, because to me they're not important. The more important thing for us, I believe, is to focus on the ideas enshrined in that Charter, embryonic as they may have been, the ideas that are the that are the true and enduring legacy of Magna Carta. Now, I have to divided today's lecture into three parts, which you can see in the outline at the top of your handout. Now, does everyone have a handout? Hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care if you don't have one. Hands, okay, so Anthony, Svet, if you could keep, keep your hands up. Okay. So, you won't be missing anything for a moment. So the three parts this afternoon. Firstly, a brief explanation of the historical background that made Magna Carta possible and ultimately necessary. This I call the stimulus. Second, a brief investigation of the Magna Carta itself. In other words, its creation, its essential content, and its immediate impact in the 13th century. This I have called the response. Third and last, the legacy. I will indicate the lasting impact of Magna Carta on subsequent law, politics, and history in England, in America, and in principle. My goal is to introduce you to the reasons that Having all of us just celebrated the Declaration of Independence and given thanks to the Founding Fathers, we should also give thanks to a handful of medieval English aristocrats, one Catholic Archbishop, and, albeit in a backhanded fashion, even to two of the most awful men of history. So, to the stimulus. What was going on in England prior to 1215? Best way, I think, to do this is to introduce you to, just very, very briefly, the, a handful of kings 
uh, England had and the contributions or the things that they did uh, that affected Magna Carta. And we start, of course, with William the first, the first Norman king of England, because the England we know today began with its conquest by William the Conqueror in 1066 after the Battle of Hastings. He and his immediate successors, his sons, grandchildren and grandsons, created circumstances, essentially inadvertently, that contributed to the Magna Carta's creation 150 years later. William I himself established two trends that contributed to this. In the first case, William attempted to bring uniformity to the laws of his new territory, his new land. The best examples of this, I think, are his famous survey of the country, the Doomsday Book, and an oath he administered to all his nobles in 1086 at the Great Gamot on Salisbury Plain. This was an oath that was intended to remind all of his barons that he, William, the king, was the supreme law of the land, and that actually there should be universal law in England. Now, in attempting to establish this universal control and these universal laws, William was less than successful since the Anglo-Saxon nobles had been used to a far greater degree of autonomy under William's predecessors, and the same circumstances that created such autonomy, essentially distance and isolation, contributed to a continuing sense of autonomy among the new Norman barons who had taken over after William's victory. Now, simultaneously, and as part of the uniformity, William also modified the Anglo-Saxon parliament, the Watangamot, into an advisory council of his own barons. The Great Council, as it was known, while it had no real power, did continue the idea that the king needed the advice, if not the actual consent, of those he governed. That the universal law he was trying to impose should at least be informed and advised, not merely the arbitrary whim of one man. Now, the second trend is that William had essentially established a mini-empire that spanned the English Channel. After 1066, both William and his lieutenants owned land in England and France. And many of William's successors attempted to build or maintain this empire for centuries to come. These imperial aspirations contributed to the downfall of several kings and circumstantially also to the events around Magna Carta. Now, fortunately, we don't have to spend the same amount of detail on some of the other kings. But we should know something about them because, well, in some cases they did something. The half dozen successes after William's death were very, very much a mixed bag. His two sons, William II and Henry I, were essentially opportunists, although they each played a role in fertilizing the English soil for Magna Carta. William II was a profligate, sacrilegious king, and he was the first successor to impose war taxes, known as scootage, in an attempt to further and develop his father's empire. Now, that, in that attempt, he was essentially a spectacular failure and an extremely unpopular one at that. Henry I, his brother, was not much better but Henry at least recognised the need to do something to overcome the taint of his brother's reign. Henry became king after William II's mysteriously convenient hunting accident in 1100. It is perhaps worth noting that people regarded William's death as the work of God since, quote, William was a soul who could not be saved. Now, partly because of his brother's unwelcome taxation, and also partly because of his own very tenuous claim to the throne, Robert, 
Henry II's elder brother had a much stronger legal claim, Henry II's most important action on assuming the throne was to issue a document called the Charter of Liberties. As soon as he was crowned, the Charter of Liberties was little more than a series of campaign promises, and we all know how reliable they can be, a series of campaign promises to the major nobles and landholders that he wasn't going to be as bad as his brother. The promises included resumed autonomy, reduced taxation, and more consultation. Promises which Henry hoped would secure the nobles' support should Robert actually challenge Henry to the throne. Now, for the record, Henry never had much intention of keeping these promises, and basically he didn't. But since he wasn't nearly as bad or demanding as William II, the barons did support Henry and he ruled for 35 years. More importantly, however, the ideas that the barons had some autonomy and that a king who acted without regard for his barons' interest was unfit to rule, these ideas were widely disseminated. And if the nobility were prepared, were prepared to turn an occasional blind eye to Henry's minor indiscretions, they never forgot that a king had promised them freedoms and a certain degree of autonomy. Now, the less said of Stephen's reign, the better, since the majority of it was consumed by a very bitter civil war with his sister Matilda. Really awful time. Henry II, however, once the war was over, Henry II's reign is of far greater note, and not just because he turned out to be King John's father. While Henry is notorious in history for the little misunderstanding that led to the murder of Thomas a Becket, it is also true, and perhaps surprising to some of you, that many regard Henry as England's greatest king. Through marriage to Eleanor of Aquitaine, who he stole from the King of France, he peaceably accomplished his great-grandfather's imperial ambition of uniting and controlling England and a sizable portion of France. And John's failed attempts to maintain and reclaim that empire were a significant factor in the events surrounding Magna Carta. More important for us, however, were the extensive legal reforms that Henry undertook during his reign. In his 35 years on the throne, and these, by the way, are the reasons he's regarded by some as England's greatest king, the court system and the royal bureaucracy were extensively overhauled, jury trials increasingly replaced the medieval trials by ordeal, the idea of habeas corpus made its appearance, and Henry made real and effective attempts to standardize the laws throughout the country. Now, Henry was no constitutional lawyer or philosopher. He did all of this to bring order to the country after the preceding civil war and to raise his own revenue. And although he made these reforms essentially as ad hoc changes to the system, they worked. And people liked them. And the nobles recognized their value to them of a more stable and orderly legal system. And the nobles were not happy a few decades later when these reforms were taken away by John. Now, Richard's reign is notable for his absence. I am sure that his great popularity in England and in English history is due to the fact that he wasn't there. He wasn't around to be blamed for what was going on. Fact of the matter is, Richard really didn't care about England at all. And he was in England for only about two years of the 11 that he was king. It is said that absence makes the heart grow fonder. And for Richard, this certainly appears to be his case, especially as his stand-in was his brother, the notoriously evil Prince John. Dun, 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 dun. And Richard's death in 1199 finally brought John to the throne in his own right, and the stage was set for Magna Carta.
Ah, King John. I can't think of anyone who actually has a more vilified reputation in history. It's easier to find character references for Judas Iscariot, Adolf Hitler, and these days even Donald Trump. In case you don't know, uh, John is the evil Prince John of the Robin Hood legend, and I believe he is marginally less popular than the Black Death. To sum up the mood of the time, certain anonymous monks wrote of John, quote, Foul as it is, hell itself is defiled by the fouler presence of King John. <laughs> Hell's made worse by him showing up. Oi! And, of course, if you know anything about English history, you, know, you will know that the English have never risked another King John. One was enough. Now, what did he do to earn such a reputation? Just a few highlights, if that's the right word. Uh, he stole a wife from one of his nobles. He's believed to have murdered his 16-year-old nephew, Arthur, in 1203. And... Probably worst of all, given the tenor of the times, given the mysticism and power of the church in the 13th century, he was excommunicated and had England placed under the interdict by Pope Innocent III in 1208. Now, I'm sure many of you don't know what the interdict is, but it was a sanction that the Pope would issue which effectively closed all churches down and forbade all religious services, in this case, for five years. Can you imagine the outcry in certain countries today if their religious buildings were closed for five years and they weren't allowed to get married or have their religious services? It's worth noting at this point... Uh, that his dispute with the Pope, uh, Pope Innocent III, concerned the appointment of the Archbishop of Canterbury. The climax of this dispute... Oh, could we have that up there, please? Thank you. The climax of this dispute was the appointment by Innocent of a new Archbishop, Stephen Langton. This turns out to have a certain degree of irony, as you will learn shortly. Now, the only reason that John was not overthrown in England because of this, I mean, having all churches closed in the medieval era is big. The only reason John wasn't overthrown because of this was that the English nobles did not care greatly for being told what to do by a pope, especially because he's a foreign pope. And this is a further indication of the unusual independence shown by the English nobility, unusual compared with the nobles of uh, the continental European countries. Notwithstanding these and other flaws in John's character, he probably would have survived but for his taxation and his abysmal record in war. The combination of high war taxes, scootage, and a woefully unsuccessful record in battle campaigns is what ultimately inspired the Barons' Rebellion and Magna Carta. So let us turn to look at that now. Here's what really triggered the Magna Carta. Between 1203 and 1208, John lost all of his French holdings uh, of, the, of his father's Anglo-French empire. So he wasn't much of a commander. In fact, he had a reputation of, a cow, of being a coward and running away from battle. But what really galled the barons was that uh, in his attempts to maintain and reclaim this land, land John imposed scootage 11 times in his 17-year reign. Now, by comparison... His brother Richard had imposed it four times in 11 years, and for the far nobler and more politically acceptable cause of financing a crusade, the Third Crusade, 
And John's father, Henry II, only imposed scutage seven times in 35 years. Compared with John, George III was a pickpocket. And not only was there all this taxation and these abysmally unsuccessful military campaigns, sometimes he didn't go, even go out on them. Sometimes he merely collected the money and kept it for himself. Essentially, John was a grasping, demanding, lazy and incompetent ruler and he was wasting the nobles' resources. For the nobles, the final straw was a triple scootage John promulgated after the failed campaign of 1214, once again for the purpose of reclaiming his lost French empire. Many barons refused to obey him. John attacked them and failed. John then tried to ingratiate himself with everyone, the English and the Pope, by suggesting a new crusade. Only the Pope bought this idea, and by early 1215, the barons were in open revolt against John. To end the dispute and curtail John's ambitions, Archbishop Langton, the one chosen by innocent, led the dissidents in an oath to withdraw their feudal allegiance to John unless the king guaranteed their rights as laid down in Henry I's Charter of Liberties. In April of 1215, 45 nobles presented these demands to John's representatives. John refused and, somewhat ironically, suggested that they have a papal commission to sort out the matter. Now, in case you're wondering why Innocent now seemed to be on John's side, or at least to be a sympathetic ear, Innocent had a separate dispute running with the King of France at the time, Philip II, and Innocent wanted to use John's imperial ambitions to teach Philip a lesson and slap him upside the head. Oh yeah, Innocent was a really religious pope. Now, the barons refused this suggestion, swore fealty to each other, and declared war on the king. Invited by the citizens of London, they occupied the city and prepared for battle. After a second failed attempt at mediation to limit John's powers, the barons and Langton finally forced a meeting with John at Runnymede on the Thames River near London in the second week of June 1215. On June the 15th, John gave in. He surrendered and signed the Great Charter, which comprised 63 separate articles, and he signed it with the Great Seal of England. Not trusting him at all to keep his word and obey the Charter, the barons appointed a council of 25 of themselves to monitor the king under threat of war should he disobey and break the charter. Now, once he left the meeting, John was a trifle upset. Reportedly, he, quote, flung himself on the floor and gnawed sticks and straws. There's an adult reaction for you, isn't it? With no intention of upholding the Magna Carta, you see, the barons knew him. With no intention of uh, keeping to its strictures but needing support, John appealed once again to Innocent. The Pope annulled Magna Carta and suspended Archbishop Langton, the very man in Innocent had gotten into an argument with John about seven years er eight years earlier. Which brings us to the Charter itself. What was in the Charter that was so anathema to John and Innocent? We don't have time to examine each of the 63 articles, and many of them simply aren't uh, relevant or of interest to us anyway. So I've selected seven of them that I regard as the most significant, which you can see on the bottom half of the front page of your handout. And let's just give you an indication of the content of the Magna Carta. Article 12 states that scootage, in other words, taxes, cannot be claimed without the consent of the nobility. 
Article 14 outlines the conditions which limited the king's ability even to obtain consent for taxation. He had to warn the barons, he had to give them ample notice and specify a convenient place for everyone to meet. He couldn't just wake up one morning and say, oh, we're meeting tomorrow at Upper Come Back to West at 2.37 in the morning. Too bad you can't make it, we'll vote without you. Couldn't do that. Articles 38 through 40 and a few others reinstated and made permanent all the legal reforms of Henry II's reign, including the writ of habeas corpus and the right to trial by jury. Article 61 was known as the Security Clause, and this essentially subverted the power of the king and therefore also of the Pope to a watchdog group of nobles. In many respects, this is the most significant of all the articles. Why? Let me bring your attention to the last part of the article's excerpt. Quote, And if we, the king, do not redress an offence within 40 days, the barons shall distrain and distress us in every way they can, namely by seizing castles, lands and possessions, and in such other ways as they can. Close quote. Translation. If the king violates any one of those 63 articles, any of the articles specified in the charter, the barons should and would take him down. And John had had to submit to this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the right of legalized rebellion. If the king, in other words, the government, acts against the rights of his subjects, then they, the people, have the right to do something about it, up to and including the use of force. And finally, Article 63, which specifies that Magna Carta is meant to be more than a one-time deal. These rights were meant to last in perpetuity and apply to all free men. Can you understand now what was so galling to John and Innocent? Magna Carta subjugated all royal and by, all, by, and by implication all papal authority, since in the medieval era a king's authority essentially derived from a blessing by the pope, subjugated all of this authority to the active scrutiny of a few common noblemen, oxymoron intended, and the points of their swords. If this idea ever caught on, monarchical and papal power would be doomed. So, now that brings us to the legacy, the effects, the lasting impact of Magna Carta. Now I note at the outset that Magna Carta did not and could not create a capitalist utopia. Archbishop Langton was not Thomas Jefferson. The barons weren't the Second Continental Congress, let alone the Committee of Five. And this was the Middle Ages, not the Enlightenment. Magna Carta is not a philosophically driven or consistent document nor could it have been. It is wrong to expect it to have been anything more than it actually was. To point out just a few obvious flaws and get them out of the way. Although Magna Carta speaks of free men, since England was a feudal system at the time, effectively there were no free men in the country. Or Magna Carta was not based on the idea of individual rights. I mean, how could it be? It's four centuries before John Locke. However, there is a pre-dawn shadow of what could develop in some of the articles. And finally, as is repeatedly pointed out by context-dropping historians today, the Magna Carta nobles weren't really interested in the rights of their own peasants, the regular people. They were basically interested in preserving their own property, not a bad thing in itself, 
but also their inherently unjust position in a feudal aristocracy. However, I maintain that to dwell on such flaws is to drop the context and to miss the point. As I described it earlier, Mount Magna Carta was a fountainhead, a starting point. Or to repeat Lord Denning's earlier description, Magna Carta was, quote, the foundation of the freedom of the individual against the authority of the despot, close quote. You see, after Magna Carta, England was essentially a new country, a better country. But you have to remember Magna Carta is just the beginning. Over the next several centuries, the rights specified in Magna Carta were not contracted, they were expanded. As the concept of free man uh, developed, more and more Englishmen and more and more English people were understood to be protected by the Charter. At the time, though, no one, neither the barons nor John, had any expectation that the original Charter would succeed, although it would soon become the foundation for the law of the land in England. Now, remember that Innocent had annulled the Charter at John's request, so essentially it was torn up and thrown out straight away. But this annulment started a civil war between John and the barons. Now, although I believe the barons would have ultimately prevailed anyway, it turned out to be a very short war, since John and Innocent both died the following year in 1216. My, my, what a pity. Their deaths effectively ended the war, but now the status of Magna Carta was still uncertain since it appeared to have been completely discarded because of the war. John's successor, his son, the ultimately ill-fated Henry III, was only nine at the time and when he succeeded the th to the throne, which means his regents were in charge. And who were these regents, I hear you cry? Well, of course, most of them had been at Runnymede, either on the Baron's side or among those of John's advisers who had urged John to accept the Charter. In other words, the new government of England basically consisted of Magna Carta's supporters. And the Barons immediately reissued the Charter in 1216. Possibly, possibly just for the same campaign promise reasons that Henry I had used with the Charter of Liberties. But then they did it again in 1217. And when Henry III came into his majority in 1225, he reissued it a third time. Clearly, those who had written the Charter and who just happened to have supervised Henry III's political education intended Magna Carta to last. Now, there were some philosophically trivial revisions made in these reissues, and it's the 1225 version that has become the official version uh, or wording that you see today. Now, a few decades later, when Henry III started to display some of his father's tendencies, there was another rebellion against the king's power, this time under the leadership of Simon de Montfort. And this led to the expansion of the Barons' Council into the first real parliament in England in 1265. Before the end of the century, Magna Carta was reissued a fourth and final time by Edward I in 1297. And two years earlier, in 1295, Edward had standardised de, Mont de Montfort's parliament into a recognisable antecedent of Britain's bicameral modern parliament. In other words, within 80 years of, Mag of Magna Carta's signing, it became the standard, it became the law in England. And its ideas had taken root and had been expanded and a constitutional government, an actual limited government, was beginning to develop. The Magna Carta's articles have been revised, some deleted, and improved over the last eight centuries in England. You can see some of these at the top of the second page uh, 
on your handout. If you take a moment to uh, look at those things, you will see an apparent flurry of activity in the 17th century. The Petition of Right against Charles I, the Habeas Corpus Act in its various forms, and the Glorious Revolution and the Bill of Rights. Keep in mind that all of this activity and discussion took place during England's first century of American colonization. The significance of this is that early, the early American colonists were certainly well aware of these constitutional discussions and issues being uh, raised in England, and they knew about Magna Carta. By the by, three of Magna Carta's articles are still on the English statute books. Article 1, which specifies the freedom and separation of the English church. Article 13, which specifies the freedom of the town, the city of London. And Article 39, possibly the most important, the right to trial by jury. Well, most important legal one. Moreover, the idea of legalised rebellion, Article 61, was central to the revolts against the Stuart monarchs in the 17th century, and especially to the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and to the Bill of Rights of 1689. That's a pretty considerable legacy, don't you think? But, as they say in all good commercials, there's more! Everything that developed in English law from Magna Carta, from the courts to the legalised rebe rebellion, to the right of legalised rebellion, naturally became part of the identity of the English colonies in America. So let us see what impact, if any, Magna Carta had on America, and particularly the Founding Fathers and the American Revolution. Now, by way of evidence, in 1775, Massachusetts adopted a seal which shows just how aware the patriots were of Magna Carta. The seal, it's probably a little difficult to read there, shows a militiaman with a sword in his, hang on, what is Is that hand, his right hand, ready to fight. And you can, see, can you see him waving a little piece of paper in his left hand? That little piece of paper has two words written on it. I'm not going to take odds that you can figure out what those two words are because the words are Magna Carta. There's a reason a copy of the Magna Carta hangs next to the Declaration of Independence in the National Archives. There's a reason a copy of it hangs on the door of Dr. Tara Smith's office at the University of Texas. And I'm pretty sure it's not that Dr. Smith is a fan of medieval Latin. So what is that reason? To quote from the Declaration, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of the proper ends of government, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. Close quote. This is the idea of legalized rebellion specified in Article 61, and the Founding Fathers knew it. The DNA of the Magna Carta is woven throughout the fabric, the genetic fabric of the Declaration of Independence. You can see it in the list of injuries and usurpations. To give you just three examples, related only to those, article, those excerpts I've given you from Magna Carta. Quote, He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from their depository of their public records. That's Article 14. Quote, For imposing taxes on us without our consent. It's Article 12. No taxation without representation. And third, Quote, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. Article 39. Now, I toyed very, very briefly with the idea of asking you today to all sing Happy Birthday Magna Carta. Now, aside from it being trite and time-consuming, 
and the fact that I couldn't fit the enormous cake through the doors, and we're all on diets anyway. Aside from that, it's, it's almost redundant. Effectively, we sang happy birthday to the Magna Carta just four days ago. You see, whenever we celebrate the Declaration of Independence, we are, by implication, also celebrating the Magna Carta. And the reason Magna Carta matters in America, the ultimate legacy of Magna Carta as I see it, is not any one particular article, actually, but the embryonic set of ideas that it represents, the ideas that suggested a path for the development of a proper relationship between government and its people. And it was a practical document with real and lasting effects. You see, in principle, what Magna Carta represents is the vital necessity of specifying, defining, and limiting the role of government, not in vague custom or precedent, but concretely in writing for all to read and for all to understand, that the power of the government must be constrained to protect the rights, liberties, freedoms of the people. And in being written down, it's actually the very start of the road to objective law that Dr. Smith was talking about this morning. Magna Carta is not merely a document that people wrote, enacted, and built upon. It's an idea that people remembered. It's an idea that inspired people across centuries and across nations to fight for their freedom. It does this in a variety of ways. It formalized existing statutes and promulgated them for everyone to see. It implies that there should be a universally known law. And by universal I here I mean that no one, no king and no government, should be above the law. It established the idea that the keeper of the laws, the government itself, is and ought to be constrained by its own set of laws, that government is not a license to tyranny. And further, that if and when government becomes tyrannical, Magna Carta declares that it is right and proper to tear such tyranny down. These are the essential ideas, the legacy of Magna Carta. If you could see among your descendants a Thomas Jefferson, You'd be pretty proud, wouldn't you? If we all here today can see in 10, 20, 30 years a freer America, which we will have played a part in creating, rightfully we will be proud as well, yes? If documents had feelings, I guess that's an idea for Pixar, right? If documents had feelings, then I'm sure that the Magna Carta would be proud of the Declaration of Independence and extremely worried about the state of freedom today. For eight centuries, every time a people have risen against a tyranny, demanded freedom and imposed limits on their leaders, whether they've known it or not, they've been acting on the ideas of the Magna Carta. To paraphrase a former countryman of mine, now that's a legacy. But such a legacy is not guaranteed. Without eternal vigilance, the price of a republic, without eternal vigilance and a willingness to stand up and say, enough, tyrants will arise. If such tyrants do arise, it may be up to us to revive the precedence of medieval English barons and America's founding fathers to reclaim the glorious, and great 800-year legacy of Magna Carta. Thank you. Thank you. And for a little Magna Carta trivia, I don't know if you realize that tomorrow, well, aside from being the anniversary of the day George Washington read the Declaration of Independence to the troops outside New York. Tomorrow also happens to be the anniversary of the death 
of Archbishop Stephen Langton, the guy who essentially wrote Magna Carta. Yes. Thank you for a most excellent talk. I appreciate the summary and the, uh, the context. Um, Thank you. I, have, I, have, I would like you to further elaborate the context about the, the culture of the time, especially in, in the context of rights. You said it wasn't, they weren't really talking about individual rights. Can you, can you tell us how they were thinking? Were, the, were there thoughts about natural rights? No, it's, uh, it's way too century uh, for any concept uh, of natural rights to have developed. That's a 17th and 18th century idea. Rights, I mean, when I'm teaching this to my students, I never use the word rights. Uh, I can do that here because you know the concept changes meaning. They were privileges. We, the barons, we have, you, you can't do this to us. We're your barons. So it's a privilege more than a uh, right that they were enacting on. And really, they only applied to the barons, to so the 45 guys who put the sword to, to John. So that brings up a follow-up. Did, did, these, did these privileges follow in any way to anyone other than the nobles? Well, not... At, at, well, it, mm -hmm. Yes and no. How's that for a definitive answer? The idea of feudalism was an exchange of promises between the lord and the vassal. And if the lord wanted his vassal's support militarily and in taxation, then he had to protect and give some uh, credence to the uh, wishes and desires of his vassals. So the great barons who were forcing John themselves had to promise their lesser barons, and the free men of England, the people who weren't out-and-out -out serfs, a certain degree of autonomy. And there were actual serfs, and in some ways, Magna Carta locked them into serfdom for another about 160 years until the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. There's no real discussion of rights until a little bit later in the century, and then only in the scholastic works of people such as uh, Aquinas. So, yes, in a very, very fuzzy sense of privilege, but nothing in the sense that we regard as the Enlightenment sense of rights. I hope that clarifies. Yes, Jean. Thanks, Andrew. So this is a total curiosity question, but if I understand in the 1200s, wasn't that about the time that Aristotle was getting reintroduced in various places? And is there any connection? Oh, yes. Yeah, no, and that's what, just what I was alluding to yeah. with Aquinas, who was born 10 years after Magna Carta. Now, if I remember correctly, so you've got Abelard from 1079 to 1142, who's the first guy to, in Europe to really start investigating Aristotle. But at that time, which overlaps the reigns of William I, Henry I, and William II, all they were looking at, the scholastics, were the works of Aristotle's logic. That's all they had. The political theories didn't really come up until a little bit later, pretty much late, 11th, sorry, late 12th century and early 13th century. And in this, actually, Aristotle wasn't much help because Aristotle's more of a... Uh, said, well, monarchy seems to work better than anything else. But certain of the other political theorists, that the, certainly the other Greek and Roman political theorists, uh, were being read throughout the 13th century, which informed more the expansion of rights post Magna Carta and justified it. I am just uh, curious about the reissuance, you know, of uh, Magna Carta. The reissues re of Magna Carta? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned that it was annulled or recalled the first time. Was it always being recalled, like, uh, all three or four times? And how did it change? Okay. Um, well, the reissues were partly... Uh, so the, the first reissue was a, basically a reassurance to everyone that, yes, we did this to John, and we're going to stick to it ourselves. And... It was more than a campaign promise, because they did it again the following year, cutting certain bits out. Now, there are some articles in there which are entirely uh, anachronistic now. There's one article towards the end which has to do specifically with dealing with the King of Scotland and giving back his land. And there are a few other ones that were no longer relevant. So they were... And that's what I mean by philosophically trivial revisions. And just 
okay, making the language more understa uh, understandable and, oh, we didn't quite think of that. It, think of it as amendments to the Constitution. Yes, Christy. Uh, this is sort of similar to Jean's question, I think, and maybe a little funny way of looking at things, but why do you think Magna Carta came about in England as opposed to, say, France or even Spain, where Aristotle was already being kind of brought back to the West? Good question. Why England and nowhere else? Because it's a funny little island that the Pope didn't care about. No offense, Godfrey. Okay. <laughs> Pardon how dare me. Okay. Um, England's distance and separation from the uh, continent meant that things always worked a little bit differently in England than they did on the continent. For a start, they got Christianity later than everyone else, because who wants to go over there? I mean, you're going to meet up with these funny-looking guys in skirts and blue paint, and they, sp they spoke this barbarous German Anglo-Saxon stuff. So the Continentals tended to look down on England, and they never tried to enforce uh, the same kind of uh, theocracy that was uh, being enforced uh, on the uh, mainland. If you know your Dark Ages history, once Charlemagne became a Holy Roman Emperor uh, in 800, he moved east into Germany, not west, across uh, to the Anglo-Saxons. And within England, so in the first place, the major political authorities on the continent tended to leave England alone. And the, the Anglo-Saxons were quite happy about this. Now, within England itself, a much sparser and di diverse and spread out population, which allowed the individual barons and nobles effectively to be their own little kings. In fact, there was a time during the Dark Ages that is sometimes referred to in older history textbooks as the Heptarchy, the Seven Kingdoms. And the Anglo-Saxons had a tradition which was different from the continental kings, uh, again, of more or less electing and advising their kings. And when the Norman nobles came in, I mean, they didn't learn to speak English or Anglo-Saxon for uh, several hundred years. They just wanted to rake the money and go back home to France where the cooking was good and the women were fine. Oh, I'm sorry, is that offensive? <laughs> um, which meant that the barons themselves were far more isolated. They had a different tradition from the continent, which was far more devastated uh, by the barbarian migrations and things. So England was better set up and differently set up, so it allowed something like Magna Carta to take hold there, but not anywhere else. So um, does that answer your... Yes? You have a lacuna of about 300 years where there were no amendments made to the charter between basically 300 and 1628. And also during that period when Shakespeare wrote King John, he made no mention of Magna Carta. Was there some reason that it sort of dropped out of uh, view? That's a good question, and I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Now, partly it's because uh, when we get to the early 14th century and into the 15th century, England's back at war and trying to build up that uh, empire with uh, France, so you have the Hundred Years' War, and oops then, Black Death. Not a good time. And England's, I mean, England's population was so decimated that England's population didn't recover until the 17th century. So there were other things on the minds of the kings for a lot of that time, and none of the kings really during that time were as atrocious as John or um, William II, or even the latter reigns of Henry III. And it didn't really go out of uh, practice. There didn't seem to be any need, I think, uh, for major revisions. Now, you could make an argument that we hit the 16th century, uh, and we've got Henry VIII doing his thing. 
But even he was acting on Magna Carta when he set up and split off the Anglican Church from the, Rome, uh, from the Roman Catholic Church, and that's still Article 1. The, Artic the Church of England shall be separate from the kingdom. There were no real legal revolutions to justify any major reforms, and I don't think it was forgotten. It was more like it seemed to be working in the background and there were bigger fish, fish to fry up front. Oh, my goodness. No more questions? Oh, I get... Oh, yes, there's a question. Uh. I don't know if this is directly relevant here. Yeah. Uh, as, as far as I know, Britain to this day doesn't have a written out constitution. I, I, is that correct? And, and how does that tie in with, with Magna Carta? Okay, it, uh, that is correct. It's not a nice seven-article constitution like the United States has. The British Constitution is a compilation of a variety, a lengthy variety of uh, statutes and what they call... Oh, um, ugh, on, um, Westminster... The customs that go, the ways you just go about doing things in uh, the English Parliament. So there, there are the unwritten rules, and the word is just on the tip of my tongue, and it's not coming out. What? It... Precedents. Precedents. Yeah. Okay, that'll do. Um, but because they've been adding to it all the time, to try and go back and rewrite it uh, would be a horrendously complicated uh, job. And on the, and I can't think of a real recent case where they've had to go in and say, oh, this is something we have to rewrite the Constitution. The, uh, what springs to mind? Um, okay, 1688. Kick James II out. No Catholic kings, are, no Catholic shall be a king of England. So they'll, they'll add them as footnotes uh, to their existing laws, but no nice, neat seven-article uh, Constitution or even a nice, neat 63-article Constitution. It's a set of precedents and practices as well as the entire body of English law. Well, when you head out tonight, have a drink on the Magna Carta, I say. <laughs>